This podcast is about introducing our fans to the animals, plants, and other products that we work with at Josh's Frogs. It's an opportunity to paint a picture of our hobby that is refreshing. We want you guys to be successful with the animals that you're keeping, and we want our hobby to grow ethically and sustainably into the future. Welcome to the Josh's Frogs podcast. Today I've got Colin. We're going to talk about Tinctorious Dart Frogs. Uh, before we do that, I just want to mention that the Josh's Frogs podcast is sponsored by none other than Josh's Frogs. Uh, we're your one-stop uh, shop from feeder insects to bioactive supplies to reptile lighting to caging. We've got it all under one roof, uh, which means that we can ship it all together in one box for you. Uh, cuts out on the cost that way. We have a industry leading live arrival guarantee on our animals and our insects. Uh, and then we have all the uh, blogs and videos and stuff like that to make uh, keeping these animals easy. Uh, we want you to be successful in that uh, regard. So check us out, joshesfrogs.com. Um, and today I'm gonna talk with you, uh, talk with Colin about uh, Tinctorious Dart Frogs. But before we start talking about the Dart Frogs, give us a little bit about your story. How did you find out about Josh's Frogs? How did you end up working here? And then give us a little lowdown on like, what's a day like in, in your job? Absolutely. So first off, thank you so much for having me on, Josh. I am tremendously excited to uh, be giving uh, educating the world on these animals that I have come to uh, love so much. So like a little bit about my story, I've known about Josh's frogs for over 10 years now. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in the hobby since I was 12 years old. My first animal was a leopard gecko and then I've continued in the hobby. I just love reptiles and amphibians. It was in my childhood. My mom has a story of uh, my neighbors were complaining that I had a bucket full of green frogs and a bucket full of garter snakes. <laughs> And then my mom told her, no, he can do what he wants. Let him play with the yeah, animals. Yeah. I really appreciate my parents. They really, um, they really cultivated an environment for me to do what I love. They've told me my whole life, do what you love. And I've uh, found a place where I'm doing what I love. So I am a dart frog breeder here at Josh's Frogs. I specifically work with the Tinctorious, which is going to be the theme of our podcast today. Um, and I am actually approaching my one year anniversary of being here. So this Congrats. is, yeah, this Congrats. is very exciting. This is like a culmination of, um, all my hard work and everything I've learned about these animals. Um, cause the interesting thing about dart frogs is before I started at Josh's frogs, they were a part of the hobby that I did not get into interestingly mm -hmm. enough, but I'm here to show you today that in no time you can be an absolute expert with these animals. They're easy to care for. They're wonderful. And they're just a lot of fun. They bring so much joy into my life. And I want to spread the message that they should bring joy into your cool. life as well. Cool. Give us like, this sounds kind of maybe mundane for you, but like, Pretend you're talking to our uncles or aunts that don't know anything about keeping frogs. Like, what's, what do you do all day? Like, what are you doing? So this will – I'll explain the life cycle of a frog <laughs> because basically my job is the life cycle of a frog. My, one, my Monday to Friday is the life cycle. For those of you who may not know, um, amphibians – the word amphibian actually means two lives. They start off their life as basically a fish. We call it a tadpole. So they live in the water for a good portion of their life, and then they are going to magically grow legs. They go through metamorphosis, and they turn into the terrestrial frogs that we enjoy outside. So Tuesday is today. I'll start with that because today is a tadpole and egg day. So today, after I'm done filming this podcast, I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to collect eggs from about 100 different breeding tanks that I have of Tinctorious. I'll then clean those eggs and store them away until they hatch in about two weeks, and I will collect their tadpoles. Um, after I'm done collecting those, I'm going to go clean all of the tadpoles that have hatched <laughs> because this job is just entirely caring for every stage of the frog until it is eight weeks old and happy and healthy to, um, for you to bring in to your life. Um, and then, so Wednesday I feed the frogs. I mean, that is like a bit, that is pretty much what I do all day. I have to feed all of the babies. So I have to feed the weak ones, the twos, threes, and so on. So we feed all of the babies. And then once all the babies are fed, I feed more frogs. <laughs> so for someone who like loves frogs, I'm obviously living my dream job. Um, that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We feed the frogs. Tuesday and Thursday is tadpole days. And the entire job is just maintaining and caring for these animals until they're healthy to be sold. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Now, you talked about that your experience is just with the tinctorious frogs. Can you tell us like what makes it a tinctorious versus some other frogs? Like what are the things that are true of tinctorious? So... Size. They're definitely the biggest dart frog, I would say. I would Phylobates, uh, the terribilis can kind of uh, mm -hmm. chase them sometimes in the size. Yep. They're the biggest uh, frog. I would say they're the boldest um, compared to Aratus and Lucamellas. They're a little bit more skittish, a little bit more Heidi. These guys, um, once you develop that uh, food frog relationship, as I call it, <laughs> they will be 
you'll wake up in the morning. These guys are dineural, which is another really cool thing about dart frogs is they're active during the daytime, whereas the majority of frogs are going to be snoozing during the day. But these guys will be entertaining you all day long. They're going to eat their bugs in the morning and then they're going to explore their tank. These guys do in their natural habitat. They're typically, they hang out in the leaf litter, but they definitely appreciate some climbing space. They definitely will climb the glass, any logs that you put in there. Um, and so on. Cool. Now, we've been calling them dart frogs. Some people will call them poison dart frogs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, are these guys poisonous? Should we be concerned about that? This is this is the age, age old question, especially as they come into the hobby. So I want to make this very clear. <laughs> in the wild, they are poisonous. Yes, because the diet that they have in the wild, they're going to be eating a variety of insects and they actually sort of steal that toxicity that the insect had and then they synthesize it for themselves. Um, so your toxicity, or I'm not sure if toxicity is the right word with touch and whatnot, yeah. but for, for the sake of uh, the talk here, the toxicity can actually vary between frogs, where I actually kind of thought it would be the standard between all the frogs. But um, Phyllobates terribilis, for example, actually has its own group because of how poisonous they are. Um, they're the big factoid frog, like their poison can kill 10 men, that yeah. big old, yep. you know, that thing. But as for keeping them in captivity, I don't even like to talk about their... Um, that they're poisonous in the wild because people kind of fixate on that. These animals are completely harmless to you in um, captivity. We um, feed them fruit flies, pinhead crickets um, that are dusted with some supplements, and then they're never going to have access to those insects to develop those uh, poisons. So these guys are completely safe to keep. Granted, that being said, a dart frog is definitely not a handle animal. Mm. Um, anytime I do have to handle these guys, I wear gloves, um, not for me because they're poisonous, but because the oils in our hands as humans can actually absorb right into the dart frog's skin. And we'll actually get more into how they can take water and stuff out of the atmosphere into their body. Um, so I just want to keep them safe, not so much myself, because at uh, shows or people see me with the gloves on, they immediately think, oh, poison dart frog gloves. He's trying to keep me safe. <laughs> I'm trying to keep my frogs safe. Yeah. So... The short answer, I mean, it's yes and no. In yep. captivity, you do not have to worry about being harmed by your poison dart frog. If it gets out, if uh, your kid gets curious and touches the poison dart frog, they're going to be just fine. The dart frog might be upset about it, but yeah. your family is going to be just fine. Cool, cool, cool. Thanks for clearing that up. Now, you talked a little bit about how Tinctorius differs from different uh, uh, species, other dart frogs. Talk a little bit about some of the morphs uh, in the Tinctorius. Like, what's your favorite? What, just go through some of the common ones. How do, how do you tell the different morphs apart? Excellent. You asked my favorite, so I am partial to, and we actually get to see some frogs here, which is going to be fun. So this is Dendrobates tinctorius azurius, if we can see them. Um, again, dart frogs are small. They only get to be about two inches. But azurius is one of the most popular morphs um, in the hobby. So they're the blue guys. Um, when I go to the zoo and they have their dart frog enclosure, I hear everyone saying, oh, I want to see the blue ones. I want to see the blue mm -hmm. ones. That fills my heart with joy <laughs> because I, I never want the magic to go away with these animals. I am so grateful that I get to work with an animal that's from the rainforest. They're such a unique and special animal. But to get back to morphs, I can digress a lot because I just have so many different things <laughs> I love to talk about with these guys. Um, the Azurius, they're a really easy one. They're the blue morph. Um, they really, it's hard to mix them up with um, the other morphs in the Tinctorius because all the Tinctorius are going to range from black, yellow, blue, and green. Like those colors kind of mix is going to uh, affect the uh, morphs. Mm -hmm. And so we have Azurius, who's our nice blue guy. And then I brought a nice contrast because there are certain morphs that do look very similar to each other i wanted to make this a little bit simple this is dendrobates tinctorius citronella which i think i've heard is josh's favorite morph of dart frog I don't the know. first one i ever had yep. citronellas. so we have some citronellas right here i um i'm one of the biology students that attended the university of michigan um so <laughs> i'm proud of these frogs because they remind me of uh, the university of michigan so i call them u of m frogs um, but they're very cool and I like to really take some extra time to talk about morphs in the dart frog hobby because it's a little bit different than morphs elsewhere in the hobby. So if we take like ball pythons and crested geckos, for example, that are sort of staples of our hobby at this point, and people have selectively bred these animals to get beautiful colors for us to enjoy. Mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful thing. The thing about dart frogs is we sort of come at it from like a conservation angle. So these frogs were not selectively bred for their color. All of these frogs get their color by where they specifically live in South America to Central America in their specific ranges. So there's a wonderful place if you get in the dart frog hobby called Suriname, which like I really would love to visit that place because I mean, in my head, it's just a magic, magical <laughs> land where I see like 
10 of my favorite yeah. animals in yeah. like a five minute span. So that would, that's like a bucket list thing. That would be wonderful. But you have these areas where, and I'll put this, make it very, very simplified. Say you have Azurius who's hanging out in a pond that is over here on the left side. Then you have Citronellas who are hanging out at the wetland that is over here on the right side. And in between them, there is a grassland or a savanna, some kind of uninhabitable area for the frog. So they're separated by these geographical features where these populations can't crossbreed, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So they sort of grow up alongside of each other. And then those specific environmental cues have caused them to turn different colors. Um, I've read certain things that the citronella is maybe yellow. You wouldn't think that that would be a camouflage thing, but the main predators in their range, the cones in their eyes cannot actually see yellow. Oh, so wow. they're actually camouflaging for their specific uh, location. And then some of it, um, there's been with some of the smaller species, there's been, um, I think with the strawberry dart frog, uh, color selection and mating, similar to birds of paradise. Mm -hmm. They want that colorful jacket. They're going <laughs> to, I call dart frog skin jackets. <laughs> um, it's like their skin looks nice and pretty. Um, it's their clothes they're wearing for the day. <laughs> um, but it's a big reason why in the dart frog hobby, um, a lot of the times, this is one of my most difficult conversations because we all love and want to enjoy our animals. Um, but a lot of times people want to mix the colors. They're very beautiful animals. Yep. They're jewels of um, nature. But we really have to ask ourselves why, why we're doing this and why we, we want to conserve what these animals were um, because there's such a special thing that happened. Yep. Um, so I think like the... And dart frogs are still being discovered now. So I think yeah. 2019 was the last one that was discovered. I believe it was Peru. And I think, it, I think the area was only like a couple of football fields. So you think these animals, there could be specific species that yeah. develop that we may not even known about, which goes into, again, why it's so important that we conserve the rainforest yeah. in general, because these habitats are so specific to these animals. And we just want to keep that alive. Um, as much as it, as much fun it is to mix the colors, we don't want to. We especially don't want to breed them. Not only when you do mix the colors, these dart frogs, they they know their own kind, so to speak. So typically, when you mix, um, if you put like an erratus with a tinctorius, they're not going to get along. You're not going to be um, creating an environment for those animals to thrive. They cool. want to be with their own kind. Cool. Tell me a little bit about more about that environment. Like, how are we setting them up here at Josh's Frogs? Give us tank size, how we're setting them up, how do we set them up, and then maybe how you, somebody might do it a little bit differently in their house. So, super easy setup. It's like, um, it's like bacon a cake. You got to get all the parts. We do bioactive here at Josh's Frogs. Um, so for those who may not know, um, bioactive to where you have a drainage layer, you have a substrate barrier, you have, um, soil that has isopods and springtails in there. You basically have your decomposers in there. You're basically trying to take a glass box and turn it into a mimic rainforest for mm -hmm. these guys. Um, so at Josh's frogs, um, downstairs, I have about a hundred 20 gallon horizontal tanks that with the tinctorious, I am working on getting them all to one to one ratios. Um, and what that means for everyone who doesn't breed poison dart frogs for their job, one-to-one -one just means that I have one male and I have one female that are in the tank. Um, tinctorious are a bit of bullies. Um, mm -hmm. With all dart frogs, females uh, can get, you know, a little feisty. They can want to defend their male. They want all the food to themselves. So, but especially with tinctorious, I found that the females are pretty dang aggressive with each other. Yeah. Um, so for the best experience for the animals to have and also increases breeding where there's no stress in the tank. Um, you keep one male and one female. Um, inside the tanks, we keep some plants. Um, a lot of people uh, end up putting a water dish or some kind of reservoir in the tank where thinking they're like another frog that likes to soak themselves. Yeah. Um, these guys are actually more terrestrial. They're going to get a lot of their water from diffusing it from the air. That's why they like really, really high humidity, 80 to 100 percent. Um, we set them up with these. These are very important to the dart frog life. I swear we've, we've bred it into them that they see this as home <laughs> and safety. Um, this is just a little cocoa hut. So we put a little Petri dish in these cocoa huts. They're at the front of the tank In the back of the tank. There's lots of really fun plants for them to, uh, go and hang out and hide in. And they just live a nice life. They have a whole 20 gallon for just two frogs. I always say bigger is better when it comes to space. I think the mindset should always be, um, 
what can I give? What's the most I can give these animals rather than what's the least I can give cool. these animals with uh, what I have, so cool. to speak. Cool. Um, you talk a little bit about males and females and trying to get to one to one. How do you tell if a tinctorius, if it's a male or if it's a female? How, how do you tell? Like we just did yellow spotted climbing toads and it's really easy. The, the males are brown. The, yellow, the, the females are yellow and blue. Like how do, how do you, uh, how are you sexing them uh, right now? So we've got some good cues. First one's going to be size. The female is going to be bigger. I don't know if we can kind of zoom in. She's a, She's hiding under the leaf now. She's like, I did not want to go on a field trip today. <laughs> She's being very kind, letting us learn from her today. Um, so the females are going to be bigger. Um, another thing that I didn't mention with the Tinctorius is like uh, they're angular. They're like trying. They're very um, lanky is kind of a good word yeah. there. I, I love them. They're so funky looking. It's just it's lovely. And the female, she has a very defined back arch, whereas the male, it's going to be a little bit more of a slope. But another one of the, uh, there's like a third giveaway, is the males have these really big fan-shaped toes with a little line, almost like a heart-shaped toe. Um, and so we probably won't be able to zoom in on that, but those are three cues that can help us decide. Another way to do it um, is if you're not sure, because like always in nature, there's rule breakers, as I um, call them. I have a male downstairs who is really big and kind of angular, but he's a, he's a boy. Same thing with a female. Um, uh, they can kind of end up breaking those rules a little bit. But a definite way to do it is if um, you figured out you have a female and you have an unknown and you're not quite sure what it is, if you put that frog into the tank for a moment, they will immediately begin to interact. Mm -hmm. um, the female, they're very territorial. What she's going to do is she is going to wrestle that other frog. And if it is a female, it will not call and she will continue to wrestle it and say, hey, get out of my territory. And if it is a male, though, he will give a call. So he will say... And they're their call if you are running a fan in your home or, and this is actually a selling point to these frogs. Yeah. They have a very quiet call. Yeah. But if any white noise is going on in the room, you're not going to be able to hear these guys. It's a very insect-like call. I can give my best impression. It's like a <laughs> There. Everyone gets to laugh at my uh, tinctorious impression. But that's the best we're going to get today. Even if we were to call in there with all of the white noise going on in here, we probably wouldn't hear him unless he was feeling very proud of himself. Um, but that's a definite way to know. That's honestly the way if I'm... I'm really, that's like my last uh, sort of uh, step that I take is I make that introduction and it's not like I leave them like that overnight. I sit in front of that tank for as long as it takes for them to start interacting because if there is bullying going on, you want to be able to step in there and separate that. Yep. Um, and that's pretty much it. And then they figure it out. And then once that male gives the call, like, he's like, hey, let me hang out. I'm cool. We can work something out. Um, and then they just hang out, eat bugs together and do dark rock things. That's cool. Uh, what it's it's cool because you have a great beard, so you um, are not familiar with this uh, analogy. <laughs> but we like to say Tinctoria sounds like an electric razor, so it, it's kind of the hum of that electric razor. It's the thing that I think it's closest to what they sound Absolutely. like. But it's it's definitely muted. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. All right, um, you talked a little bit about petri dishes and the cocoa huts. Um, talk us through the actual act of breeding. Like what what's happening then, and like how often are they laying eggs? How how many eggs are laying? G walk us through that. So. Unlike a lot of frog species, I sort of, uh, I call dart frogs rapid fire strategy. Um, <laughs> a lot of frogs are going to lay maybe like one to two times a year, if that, and they're going to lay massive clutches, like a lot of toads, lots of frogs all at once. Um, whereas dart frogs, they kind of go for the all the time. Yeah. So my job uh, never ends. Um, today I'm going to collect eggs. Every single week I'm collecting eggs. And I would say that it's, almost weekly, at least bi-weekly, that they're going to be laying eggs. They'll go and dispel their eggs, do the thing, rinse, repeat. Again, these are the kind of animals where in the wild. Um, it's uh, quantity over quality. That's uh, The frog is that kind of animal where they're, but they just don't do it all at once. They just do it all the time, every mm -hmm. single week. Um, and they're going on it. And I think that was, um, that for that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about humidity, the 80 to 100%. Talk to us about temperatures. What are, what are the temperatures that we should aim for when we're keeping dart frogs? So I feel a lot of the times people make a mistake when we think of a rainforest animal, hot, right? Yeah, the, the rainforest is hot, so you probably want it warm. So the thing about where dart frogs live in the rainforest, we have to remember that these are forest floor dwellers. So they're going to be hanging out where not a lot of sunlight actually gets to those rays that are going to make a lot of that heat. So dart frogs actually thrive in 70 to 80 degrees at the most. Mm -hmm. And anything beyond 80 degrees, you can start to see some heat stress. Um, so it actually works out as a good house pet because it's like right at the temperature of your home. Another cool thing about them is they don't require really complicated lighting. Um, they don't need the UVB that a lot of other um, more uh, arboreal species need. Yep. Um, so they're, you just need a plant light for a day and night cycle and to keep your plants happy and then they're good to go. Cool, cool. Now, 
Anything else that you'd want to tell us about Tinctoria, somebody who's never kept them before or about how hard they are to keep or, or some things to watch out for? Anything that you want to tell us about those types of frogs? I've been around so many frogs in my life, and these guys have just got... They're just... And I've been looking for the word. I've been thinking about this and looking for the word to describe these guys because bold is definitely it, but they're just... They're curious. They're funny. They're... They... they I don't even want to say bully, but I feel like sometimes when I go into the room and they're all right at the front of the tank looking at me like, yeah, you're going to give us the bugs. Like they just, and maybe it's because and I kind of think that they, there's just not a lot of fear in them. Yeah. And it might be because with these poisonous animals, yep. you know, they've genetically, they don't feel a need to fear things. So just very brave. They're bold. They're, they're funny to watch. They're goofy. Like mm -hmm. they're, they're just a really, really treat of an animal to be able to enjoy. And the longer um, you keep keep them and feed them. You'll really see that they have their own little individual personality. Sometimes you'll get one that's a little bit more shy than the yep. other. Sometimes you'll get, I have one where when I go to get eggs, it just climbs up my arm. And I'm like, okay. So it clearly has no fear of me. He's like, oh, the, the warm branch has come into the tank again. I got to explore this. So they're, they're just a lot of fun. And, you know, I've been doing it a year now. And every single day there's there's some kind of something new that brings cool. me joy with these guys. Cool. Colin, thanks for educating us on Tinctorius. Really appreciate that. Um, let's move on to the lightning round. I'm going to go through these questions. Just give me the first thing that comes to your mind. If you if you can't, if nothing comes to your mind, if you're just a blank slate, then just say pass. And we'll go on to the next question. Okay. All right. You ready? All right. If money and space were no issue, what is your dream pet that you would have? I would buy land and have a conservation area. Cool. Um, I, I thought about this one a lot. I, I may have looked at the questions. I don't want to, um, but I thought about this one a lot because like if money weren't an issue, I would, um, I think about Steve Irwin, who's, yep. I think like everybody's hero in this yep. building. Um, he just, what do you do with all his money? You just buy land, just buy yep. land and conserve animals, especially with, um, you know, deforestation and these yep. kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I just want to conserve these wilderness areas for generations to come. Cool. So cool. that's what I would do. All right. Besides Josh's frogs, what's another brand in our hobby that's either producing really cool products or really cool animals? Who would you like to give a shout out to? Can I do two? Go for it. Go okay. Two. So Exoterra for tanks. All of my terrariums at home are from Exoterra. They make wonderful products and mm -hmm. I've been using them for years. Um, and the other is Rapashi. Cool. Um, I wouldn't be able to do my job without Rapashi. <laughs> um, Rapashi's uh, supplement uh, products and um, meal replacement yeah. uh, for geckos. It's just, it's the best in my opinion. Cool. Cool. All right. What was your first pet? You talked a little bit about leopard geckos. Did you have something before the leopard geckos? The leopard gecko was the first, but I could go through my whole childhood <laughs> regimen. It could be quick. Um, it was a leopard gecko, giant day gecko, toke gecko, three white tree frogs, <laughs> And then that was it before I started it. Am I, oh, if I forget anybody, I'd feel so bad. I'll like remember when I go home. Oh, I had a pixie frog. I had a pixie yeah. frog. Okay. See, I forgot somebody. Okay. So I had a pixie frog. Um, and then coming to here, I got into the dart frog hobby and now I have over 30 dart frogs. So, oh, wow. and I, I have a rack at home. I call it Josh's frogs junior. Um, where I, get the, I, I truly love my job and truly take it home. Like yep. I, I live the frog life. Like yep. I am very, very grateful that I just get to, I, I'm not, I'm not working. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I'm truly doing something I believe in that I'm passionate cool. about. So it's wonderful. Cool. All right. In the whole world, what's your favorite animal or plant? You can pick one, but what, what's your favorite? What's the coolest? This is cliche, but I, it's a frog. Like the yep. frog is my favorite animal. <laughs> I, it, it toad tree. Like it does not matter what kind of frog that shape is the shape of my heart. Basically it's just a frog. Um, so I know that's cliche, but I, I thought about that one too. And it's frog, uh, plant is monstera, that general family. Yep. yep. Cool. Cool. All right. What did you want to be when you were a kid? So I didn't want to, I didn't have a job that I specifically said, but I would go around saying that, and my parents, this is going to make my parents smile very hard. I wanted to be a take care of her. I called it a take care of her. I wanted to take care of things. Oh, wow. Um, and which as a kid, that may have been like, you know, like putting a band aid on my dad yep. or whatnot. Granted, as I became older, I definitely didn't want to go into the medical field yeah, by yeah. any means, but I wanted to take care of animals. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to take care of people. And I do that in a way for my friends, make sure they're all good. And now I get to take care of animals cool. um, and feed myself uh, with it. So I, Cool. I'm at a loss for words. I'm cool. very grateful. Cool. All right. Uh, you had an hour of free time. What is it that you're doing? What are you, what are you doing when you have free time? I've, I've got a lot of hobbies. Um, I'm a musician. 
Um, what do you play? Uh, piano. Piano. Um, cool. So I play piano since I was 12 years old, and that's just been an adjacent hobby. And, cool. Um, been doing that for a long time. Uh, I like hiking outside. I do stuff with my frogs. I like video games. Um, I'm a human being. Yeah. I like spending time with my family. Just uh, I'm just a regular person. Cool. Like everybody else. So, cool. Cool. Yeah. All right. If you had a bunch of people listening to you that gave you their ear, what is one thing you'd remind them of or tell them of? Or what would you communicate to people if you had, you had it, the ear of everybody? Life is very short. And do what you love. Find something on this planet that makes a fire in your belly and do that live your life compassionately and empathetically and try to practice patience with those around you because we're all trying to get through it together and that would be about it cool thank you colin thank you for dropping some uh, knowledge bombs on us for caring for these animals but just in, in life in general i appreciate that um colin is a staple here at justice frogs you see him on the lives and and some other videos that we're doing and uh some of the blogs and that kind of stuff so check out any of his uh stuff on justice frogs on across social media um but thanks a lot colin for educating us on tinctorious uh, dart frogs thank you so much for having me today Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoy this content and want to stay up to date, make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us across social media. We always want to bring you the best content, so let us know if you, what you think in the comments. And for all your reptile and amphibian needs, be sure to check us out at joshesfrogs.com. We have an amazing selection. Until next time, stay curious, stay froggy, and keep exploring. <laughs>